Hi there, I'm Judy Holland, and welcome to Happy Nest, the podcast where you can hear the latest research and best advice for living well when your kids leave home. Join me as I interview experts and explore how to reinvent yourself during this critical passage. I hope you'll head over to judyhollandauthor.com and check out my new book, Happy Nest, Finding Fulfillment When Your Kids Leave Home. I'm here today with Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, a world expert on emerging adults or young people from 18 to 29. This phase of life is quite distinct from the teen and grown-up adult years. Jeffrey is a psychology professor at Clark University in Worcester, Mass, and he has researched and written two books that have altered my parenting tremendously. He co-authored Getting to 30, A Parent's Guide to the 20-something Years, and Emerging Adulthood, The Winding Road from the Late Teens Through the Twenties. Jeffrey has extensively researched how and why young people are reaching the milestones of adulthood later than their parents. But today, I spoke with Jeffrey about how to help our emerging adults thrive now that many of them have been sent back home to flatten the coronavirus curve. Being quote-unquote boomeranged home in the midst of a global pandemic is a lot to get a grip on for both generations. So Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, I'm so glad to speak to you again. Jeffrey is a world-class expert on young adults, which he also refers to as emerging adults. Welcome and thank you so much, Jeffrey, for breaking my self-imposed isolation with a conversation. You're welcome. I'm always happy to talk to you, Judy. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, so Jeffrey, I know that you have two, just as I have, have two uh, young adults who have boomeranged back. I actually have a third on our way from Nashville. How do we talk to or listen to is probably better, our emerging adults about coronavirus and about the giant shock and transition this has made in their lives, especially many of them in college? Well, I think you did right on noting that it's important to listen and not just talk and to hear what they have to say about it. I mean, they are really disrupted by it, as many of us are, but the disruption for them may be even greater than for older adults, I would say, because many of them are in school and now school is kaput, or at least it's gone electronic. For now, if they're not in school, they're in a lot of service jobs. They are the people who are the servers in restaurants and the baristas in the the Starbucks and the restaurant bartenders. There, a lot of them are in those service jobs because they're still in school or because they are out of school but not sure what to do next or the between jobs. I mean, they are really going to be hurt by this economically, I would say more than any other age group because they, so many of them depend on these service jobs that are now just disappearing rapidly. Right. And that's, that's really anxiety producing, isn't it? I mean, not only have you been pulled away from your girlfriend or your boyfriend and your, your athletic teams and your, your orchestra, but you also now have money worries? Well, yeah, but I would say, Judy, the one thing that they have going for them that you and I don't, people our age don't so much, is that it's okay for them to move home again. That's something that is very common even before the coronavirus crisis. It's been very common for some time for people to move home at some point in their 20s because they've lost their job because they're in between education and work because a cohabiting relationship or a marriage is broken up. There are a lot of reasons why people might move home. And so in the twenties, it's very typical. And so that much they have going for them. They can rely on us the way your kids have and the way mine have by moving back in until things calm down and they can move on with their lives again. Right, absolutely. And I think I first read in one of your books about how 
right now we have about one out of three uh, young American adults living back at home again. And that is just by a whisker, a statistical whisker that is just, that is bigger than any other living arrangement for young adults, right? It's it's bigger than living with a romantic partner or with your friends. It's just, and it's, there are many, many reasons for that. But so boomerang is already happening and we accept it in our generation. So in that regard, the blow is a little softened. A little bit, but it is always hard, I think, because we get used to living a certain way and we raise our kids up. And of course, we care for them the best we can and love them all we can when they're young. And then they leave home. They might come home for college summers or between jobs and so on. But for us as adults in midlife, we're new, we're used to a new normal, right? I mean, once our youngest kid moves out, we're used to a new normal of our couple relationship, or if we're unpartnered, then of living alone. In my case, I imagine in your case, I think for many of us, we're delighted that they've moved home, but it also requires an adjustment. It's an adjustment for them, but also for us, because we all are getting used to this new arrangement. And and in this case, it's, it's quite abrupt. It's not like the college situation where you know months in advance your kids are going to come home in may and they're going to stay till mid-august this is something quite different right where they've come home rather unexpectedly and now they're going to be here for five months and maybe longer nobody knows how long this is going to last Right, right. So you and I have spoken about this before and both written about how do you set the ground rules? You know, if you get a boomerang child that, not in a coronavirus boomerang, but generally speaking, we've spoken about setting the ground rules just to make the household harmony better. What what about that? Do you Can you apply those to this situation? I think so. I think it's important to talk about it openly and not just let it go in this implied way and and not define the ground rules. I think with any adults you live with, you would want to sit down and say, okay, who's responsible for what and when? And I think that means the meal preparation, the shopping, the laundry, the cleaning, all those things have to be done. And there's more of it to do with more people in the household. So it's important to sit down early on and have that conversation. I I will admit on my part that we haven't had that conversation yet. (laughs) Uh, My son just got home a couple of days ago. So my wife and I were talking about it and saying that we'll have that conversation soon. We didn't want to spring that on them (laughs) immediately. They're both naturally a little disoriented, but we are soon going to sit down and have it. And in our case, we've done this before because we had a family gap year, as we called it, uh, a year in between their high school graduation and, and their entrance to college. I have twins who are 20 years old now. And we had that year where we all shared the cooking and shopping and cleaning and laundry. And this is not going to come as, as a surprise to our kids. But I think for all of us, if we have an adult, even an emerging adult, our child move into the household, We have to have that conversation. It's certainly better for them as well as for you that they're taking equal adult share of the responsibilities and not just having you do everything for them. Absolutely. But you just mentioned so that you're kind of given a little bit of a grace period, give them a few days to sort of get a grip because the rug's been pulled out from under your two kids. So what, just talk about like as a psychologist to me, sort of how do you... I mean, this is the twilight zone for me and you, but we've seen a lot more. I mean, how do you help them get just a grip on on being here? You know, that's not what they expected. I think it's hard, Judy, honestly. I think it really gets to the heart of this tricky issue between parents and emerging adults, which is how much do you try to instruct them and guide them and how much do you lay off? I think that's a tough issue for all of us who have emerging adults. And we're constantly asking that question because it comes up all the time, whether it's on their daily habits, what they eat, how late they go to bed, or 
larger things like what they're studying in school and where they're living and whom they're living with, we always have to ask that question. How much do we offer guidance on how much do we just lay that off and, and have them make their own decisions and maybe their own mistakes? Yeah. So I think in this case, that comes up too, whereas their home, they're disrupted and maybe disoriented. And each of us has to make that call about how much we inquire based on what we know about our kids and how we know the history of our relationship with them. So I'll give you an example. Just this morning, my daughter, usually ebullient and full of zip, seemed kind of down at breakfast. And my wife mentioned it to me. And we discussed whether we should bring it up with her, see if something was troubling her. And we decided not to for now. And then at lunch, she came down and she was making lunch alongside us. And she said, boy, I'm tired today. And so it turned out to be (laughs) just that she's kind of tired. I mean, she and I just moved her stuff home yesterday. (laughs) And she's just tired. I mean, that was a lot of work and driving back and forth. And now she's getting used to this new normal. So that's an example of how it can go. I, I think each of us has to make that call, as I said, based on what we know about our kid and about the history of our relationship with them. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, we were sitting at dinner. We, I have my singer-songwriter from Nashville apparently in the car slowly making her way here because the music scene's been shut down. And Oh, yeah. You know, she also works on the side as a bartender at night, and that's getting shut down, so she's yeah. on her way. But my the two that were here, both in their 20s, the my middle child, Maddie, had said, well, this feels really backwards. It feels like I'm going backwards. And it's probably me stepping over the line a little bit too much, probably telling her that she didn't have enough green beans and mistaking her for an eight-year-old, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all know that temptation. <laughs> so I've got to stop that. And you have, when you're in the same, you're at the same dinner table, you're in the same dining room, you're eating off the same plates. It's, you know, this and everything else. It's very hard. I think we have to check our impulses and say, wait a minute. This is a 20-something, and this is not a middle schooler that needs to be told to eat her beans. Well, I think that's a great example, Judy, and I've seen that come up a lot in the interviews I've done with emerging adults. The way when they move home, for whatever reason, it feels like a step backward to them. Even if they get along with their parents and love their parents and are grateful that they have a welcome home to come back to, it still feels like a step back. Right. And, it, and honestly, it is. Uh, hopefully a temporary one, but all of us in our society expect the kids are going to move on and they're going to become independent and they're going to make a life for themselves. So when that process stops or reverses and they come back home, it feels like something's wrong. It may even feel like a failure. But it's almost always temporary. That's what I encourage parents and emerging adults to remember when kids move home. It's almost always temporary. If it's not, you'll know because there's some serious problem, probably a mental health or physical health problem. But otherwise, they're keen to move on when they can and they will. And so one way to look at it is just to savor this rare opportunity to spend time together. We were talking about that in my family too, how, you know, we never thought we'd again be together for five straight months, which we're going to be now, Mm -hmm. at least till August, we'll all be together. And we didn't ever think that would happen again once they went away to college. Right. Fortunately, we get along well together. And so there are aspects of that that we can really enjoy. So maybe there is an opportunity in this. I'm hearing some surprisingly adult comments and I'm I'm getting to know them in a in an interesting way as almost adults. And I'm actually grateful for that and I think I think they seem to be okay with it as long as as long as I don't correct them too much on their eating habits. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard both emerging adults and parents talk about that a lot, how they really enjoy getting to know each other as adults and the way that changes the relationship and what they learn about each other. 
And so, yeah, that is a reward of it. At the same time, I don't, I don't want to underplay the difficulty of it, the challenge of it. Suddenly your household going from two people or one person to three, four or five. Right. That's an adjustment. None of us should feel bad about that, about feeling thrown off our usual way of doing things. I think, of course we are. Mm-hmm. Because this is not what we expected and not what we had planned for. Right. And now I, I have think I have three dogs now instead of instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Now you have, have one kid to walk each dog, right? There you go. Well, let me shift you to uh, something more practical. So I have two kids that are going to be that are going to be schooling online for their first time ever, starting I believe on Monday. How do we, I've, I've read a lot of uh, positive psychology, you know, about, about workspaces, because also as a writer and podcaster, I work at home, and there, there's a lot of psychology about, you know, working in certain rooms. Like me, I'm, I do a lot of Italian cooking, so I don't want to work in my kitchen or near my kitchen because I might get up and make a marinara sauce. And so I am on the second floor, and I shut myself into my library so I can't get out. And then, and that helps me separate. What about these young adults, Jeffrey? How do we help them structure their workspace and or their schedule? Not to be overstepping like with the green beans, but how do we help them structure their schedule and everything to efficiently and happily finish school? That's a great question, Judy. I think it's a difficult one potentially i mean in 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 our case it's fairly easy because our kids just left home 18 months ago so they still have their rooms to move back into and each of them has always had a desk in their rooms where they do homework they have that since they were kids and so they're just moving back in but i think your question is a really good one for parents who may have downsized or may have converted one of the rooms into their office or their Zumba room or or their art room or something right because naturally when we when they leave and we think they're gone we find other uses for that space so i think that's got to be especially challenging because everybody wants to have their space everybody's going to need their space to work electronically now you know in the case of our kids uh take their classes through these video lectures they're still going to be in school, in a sense, that they're uh, taking courses and they have work to do. So again, I would just say, have that conversation like you would with another adult who moved in, who's going to have what space and how can we arrange the existing space in a way everybody is reasonably satisfied with. Right. But again, I'm not, I don't want to pretty it up too much. It's going to be hard. <laughs> don't pretty you it know, up. You, yeah. like, <laughs> you probably like that Zumba room and now it's going to be back to be in a bedroom and an office for your emerging adult and you're happy to provide it hopefully but it it's not something you should try to pretend is is easy right no i think everybody wants my library my library is all set up i got a little click on fireplace and it's you know everybody Uh, wants my library because i wasn't working in here i was working at cafes before (laughs) now i'm in a library Yeah. So we're going to wow. have to book. We'll have to book times in the library, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought that's a good point to bring bring up, too. It's not only that we're together unexpectedly, right, all of us who have emerging adults. It's that we can't go out anywhere to get our own space. Right. Uh, we, uh, we can take a hike in the woods. Yeah, <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> but we can't go to the coffee shop or the restaurant or out with friends and other things. And that definitely adds a, another dynamic that's stressful. You're right. No, absolutely. And I, my husband and I, after our third child left, we, we changed things a lot, a lot. And we started to just go out and grab an appetizer and a glass of wine for dinner. I can walk to 10 restaurants, but I can't anymore because everybody's I shuttered. That, I know the name of that too. We've been really enjoying it, my wife and I. <laughs> and now that's gone. That is gone for the foreseeable future it'll come back eventually but it's gone for now and we don't know how long it's gone for 
Absolutely. Well, let's talk about motivation because motivating teenagers I've written a lot about, but I generally haven't thought that much about motivating young adults, especially after they're in college or out of college. How do we, one of my, my daughters who does lots of community service work and has worked with a lot of people in poverty, came back just shaking her head for a few days and saying, you know, that she doesn't feel motivated. She needs to dive into her schoolwork in a few days, but but because it all kind of seems pointless because she's reading that people are dying. She's worried about grandma and grandpa. How do we, are there things that we can say to sort of help them maintain motivation and keep the big perspective? Even I lost myself for three days or so just in shock in just twilight zone and I couldn't promote my book or write stories because I just thought what so the, I think some of these younger kids may may feel that but to a greater extent well I think you're right Judy but I'm sad to say I think the answer is no there's not much you can do to give them motivation as emerging adults it's not like when they were six or even 16 they need to find their own by now and no matter how well-meaning you are, in most cases, I've seen this so many times among emerging adults, they don't want that from you by the time they get to be in their 20s. They know they have to find it on their own. There are things you can do indirectly, Judy. You know, I think by providing a welcoming, loving space for them to be with, with you, you help calm things down for them and help them find the new normal, help them dig their way out of this trough that a lot of us have fallen into Yeah. with this coronavirus. But I, I wouldn't recommend being more direct about it. Most of them bristle at that, even if they know you mean well. It's that they're so intent on their own self-direction and their own self-sufficiency yeah, they they won't see that as is something that's helpful in most cases. They'll see it as intrusive. So it's okay to do it, but do it indirectly. You know, make make them a, a cup of tea or go for a walk together. You know, think of something for dinner that you can make together. Right. That you know they like those kinds of things are are things they'll really savor and they will have the indirect effect of helping them find their own motivation back themselves right right and i think also just i mean what i try to think about is just modeling as much normalcy as i can and it's probably easier for me than it is for some because i'm used to working at home and i'm used to being adaptable because i'm a journalist and you never know when things are going to change and you're completely upending everything i was out scheduling speeches on my book and I can't give those now. So I'm, I have toggled and now I'm writing stories and going on podcasts and doubling, I'm doing more podcasts. And my kids are seeing those adaptations. It's kind of, an, and I'm just hoping that there's a little bit of a monkey see monkey do because theirs is going to be in a different flavor, right? I'm hoping I can, we just model productivity. <laughs> well, I think you're on target there. I think those of us like you and like me who are, in professions where we can still continue to do what we do are fortunate. And so the people I worry about more are frankly, people like your daughter who is a musician in Nashville as well as works in a bar. And now both those things are gone. Right. So people who are in service professions and people who are in artistic professions, wow, they are going to be slaughtered by this. Right. We were so we were planning to go into Boston this last weekend to see a play in a theater and to go out to a fabulous Boston restaurant for dinner. And both those things got killed. Yeah. And now all the people who are depending on our income, us and others who would have been at their theater and been in their a fine restaurant, they don't have that money either. So I think... It's a tough time. I hope this will bring out the best in many of us in how we care for each other and how we can be generous to the people who need our help the most because there's no doubt that this is going to be a tough time and it's going to be really tough for people like artists and who are in service professions where 
they're just going to go dark for who knows how many months. Right. Well, you know, my husband's been walking, sending videos from the halls of major medical centers where he is a surgeon. And a lot of his surgeries, unless they're really urgent, they're being canceled. And lots of doctors, anesthesiologists particularly, are just concerned about infection. So just about every walk of life is affected. And I would I would think initially, I'm thinking, well, my retired parents aren't affected, but actually they are more than anything because they're they're in their mid eighties and they're they're concerned about about weathering this and surviving it if it if it comes into their neighborhood. Yeah, that's important to note is that the risk clearly goes up with age of getting very sick and of dying if you get the virus. So those are the people I think we need to be concerned about above all if we know people who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, we have to be sure we don't carry the virus to them. Right, right. But of course, Jeffrey, I'm 60, right? So (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm 62, so I'll include myself (laughs) in this. I feel pretty good today, but I'm very aware that the risk group has been described as 60 plus. I know it. That struck me even harder than when I got that AARP thing several years ago. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so let's talk about the people that need help. So I have a friend who's coming back from a an unsuccessful cancer surgery and is flying back into this country, and I'm going to go get their groceries tomorrow and leave them in front because I don't want to immunocompromise somebody who's who's already um, has some shaky health. Should we should we encourage our kids? I was thinking, do I have one of my kids come with me to pick those things up and drop them off? Does that make sense? Of course, they're also very busy academically, but I'm wondering, for me, that provides some perspective. I just feel like I'm I'm useful beyond my journalism or my interviewing or whatever else I'm trying to do intellectually. Well, I think it's great you're doing that, and I think it's great to do those things. I think for your emerging adults, it'd be okay if you asked one of them to keep you company. Right. But I wouldn't make it a lesson. Yeah. Again, e- even if they think you're right and admire what you're doing, they're beyond the age where they really want to be instructed. Yeah. And you're still instructing them, as I think you just acknowledged, by your example. <laughs> They'll know you're doing that. But they just don't want to hear a lesson about taking care of your neighbor. Right. Uh, I'm just being very blunt about it. I I know how they respond to that kind of thing. Yep. And even if they think you're right, and even if they were planning to do something like that themselves, they don't want to be explicitly instructed in that way. Right, right. I'm going to, I promise you I'm putting the green vegetable things down. Right. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, So, Bramita, so what other, um, what did I forget to ask you? What other, Jeffrey, what other advice and tips can you offer to, to young adults or to older adults, like, like middle-aged adults like me in just kind of getting a grip on this. You know, I find myself, I'm going right along and I'm busy and I'm doing stuff. And then I sit down and then I stop for a minute and I think, what? It's like, I keep forgetting that I'm caught up in this weird pandemic. I go about my business and then I'm just jarred continually. (laughs) My, my, although maybe that's just me. My son says he's aware of it all along. He's a little more rational. But what other, yeah, I mean, what what kind of existential advice can you offer all of us? Well, I'm going to point instead of something much more practical, Judy, which is bringing back the family dinner. So that's something that many of us have gotten away from in recent decades because we're all busy with a lot of different things. And by the time they get to be emerging adults, of course, they either move away or they're in the household and constantly doing their own thing. I think there's a lot, or, or we're sitting down together for a so, so-called family meal, but everybody's looking at a, at a device, right? right? And I think there's a lot of value in the family dinner without devices for bringing people closer. And I think in this very strange era we're not we're now in i think there's a special value to it because it gives us a chance to share information so this thing is changing constantly and new things are coming about out about it all the time and it's important for all of us to have the latest information that family dinner 
table is where we could share that information. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. I just learned today that you can be you can be asymptomatic mm -hmm. for days and yet carrying it to places where you communicate it to others right. without even knowing it. Yep. I think everybody needs to know this. And I think young people especially need to know it because they are less likely to get sick with this than older people are, but they still can be carriers and they can carry it to other people. And so there have been various media reports of young people, emerging adults going out to bars and restaurants and parties and sort of scoffing at the danger of the virus. That's something that isn't real surprising. I mean, people feel vigorous and healthy when they're youthful, most people do. And so that makes them sometimes a bit less inclined than their older uh, family members or, or neighbors or friends to heed health advice. Mm -hmm. But I think we all need to know that it's not just us as individuals who are involved here. We're all involved in it. And I don't think any of us wants to be the one who carries this to somebody who dies from it. Right. And so I think we all need to share information. I think the family dinner is a great place to do that. And I think also, Judy, I would just recommend finding ways to have fun through this because fun is in short supply right now, right? Right. We can't go to restaurants. We can't go to shows. All the sports that many of us enjoy are suddenly gone and so on. I mean, it's a long list of things that we normally enjoy that now we can't do. Right. So look for ways to find the fun. That would be my closing recommendation. Look for ways to find the fun. There is fun to be had. And if, if we're lucky enough to get along with our kids, if we're lucky enough to have a, a reasonably happy and functional family life, there's a lot of fun to be had in the family. I mean, that family dinner making it and having it over a nice bottle of red wine is still something I personally would really recommend as a source of fun. No, I think that's a fantastic, easy, practical uh, piece of advice with a lot of bang. And interestingly, we have, I felt so sorry that my son lost his lacrosse team that I, I've gone out to some fields with him, although I think he's found that I'm the worst lacrosse player he's ever seen, but he's teaching me <laughs> and he's laughing. He's laughing at how much trouble I'm having at following the directions and, and about what powder puff shots I'm shooting. But we have just had a hoot of a time, and then we've put together some social media posts showing the, this horrid contrast between between <laughs> me and him. And, and it's just, uh, uh -huh. you know, I'm, I'm a broken down figure skater. I'm not like a guy with the ball, you know. <laughs> um, That's a lovely example. That's a lovely <laughs> example. And it just shows how diverse... The ways can be that we can all find the fun in this crisis. No, absolutely. And and my closing comment to you is that I have found surprisingly and shockingly, maybe this is a bad reflection on me, but that that my my two kids that are here now are are even more cautious about potentially being silent carriers of coronavirus or or getting it or passing it on to the point where like my son's walking around I went and got groceries with him he doesn't want me to go alone because he's got gloves in his pocket he's got he's got he's handing me he's handing me special disinfectant for my purse everywhere I go he's mm. he's souping up and he's got more he's got a lot of chemistry in his background which I don't I don't even know what a molecule is so that's <laughs> helpful for me mm. helping to make up for my deficits and uh <laughs> so I'm finding some of these younger these millennials and so forth really are very focused in and depending on your skill set you know you have well, different appreciation yeah and I, I often find myself defending them because they're often criticized for being a selfish uh careless generation but i've often f found the opposite to be true me too it's really an exceptionally idealistic generation that really wants to do some good in the world so your example of your son i think is a beautiful one and I think there will be hopefully a lot of examples like this in the weeks and months to come of how this crisis, as tough as it is, can hopefully in some ways bring out the best in us. 
Right, right. And I think I'm looking forward to Lindsay returning with her guitar and her new songs and we'll light a fire and we'll have live performances in our living room. And, you know, that's, we're going to make the best of it because that's what we have. We don't know how long it's going to last, but this is where we are and no, nobody did it. This is where we are. So I think we all are, we all seem to be getting that here. It's just that there are just, you know, moments of exasperation and frustration, but we're, we're all kind of helping provide levity and enriching others each other's lives because that's really just what we got i think that's a lovely example and i hope a lot of people find ways to do that good deal well thank you so much it's always just a one a great pleasure when i have the opportunity to speak to jeffrey jensen arnett and jeffrey i loved your your book right the winding road help me out remind me emerging adulthood the winding road from the late teens through the 20s and my book for parents with Elizabeth Fischel is called Getting to 30, A Parent's Guide to the 20-something Years. And I think they're both fantastic, and I have read them both cover to cover and made little notes on the side. So you don't have to worry. I won't be selling them again on Amazon because nobody would buy them. They're so marked up. So, <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much, and I wish you all well in your households. And all our happiness listeners are so fortunate to hear from you, as am I. Thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into my happiness podcast, where we explore how to get the best out of the empty nest. I hope you'll subscribe, write a review, and reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Check out my website, judyhollandauthor.com. Have a great day, and remember, make it happen.